We're supposed to be in First Peter. I know, I know, we're going to get there. Uh, not tonight, um, but what we're doing is we're going to use Matthew 26 as kind of a jumping off point, if you will. And uh, I heard a sermon on the life of Peter years ago um, from one of my favorite uh, preachers, Brother Wayne Hardy, who passes a church up in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And it's from this passage of Scripture, and so that's really kind of the impetus uh, to the, the message, I, I guess I could say. But I think it's important for us before we get into 1 Peter uh, to understand how did, how did Peter get to the point where, okay, we, we know Peter's life, we know uh, what kind of went into Peter's life and, and kind of the events of Peter's life, if you will. What happened? Uh, how, how did God get him from where he was to be able to use him to write the books of 1 and 2 Peter, certainly to use him in the way that he did in the book of Acts. And I hope you'll see it tonight as well. As I believe the, the scripture is going to make um, pretty plain for us. And just a great story. I hope you'll, you'll get in. And it is a true story. It's a great narrative here. Matthew 26. If you find uh, verse number 36, stand if you're able to do so. We want to honor, again, the reading of God's word tonight. Matthew 26. Verse number 36 with the question, so what makes the difference? What, what is it that makes the difference? Matthew 26, look at verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he, Jesus, went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh again, uh, sorry, he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them, wow, asleep. And saith unto Peter, what? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold. The hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going, for behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Let's pray. Lord, need your help, certainly in the message. Need your help to convey truth and certainly to make some application. Pray that you would be the one making the application. Help us, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. I remember having to read the novel by Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. Many of you may have read that or uh, at least got, uh, bought the cliff notes. You know, you cheated uh, when you were supposed to read that. Um, maybe you know the first lines of the book. Uh, it was the best of times. It was the... Okay, good. A couple homeschoolers got that. I'm glad about that. Thank you for that. So that well-known first paragraph, well, somewhat well-known, I thought it would be maybe a little bit more well-known than that was, it goes on to state, Dickens says it was the season of light and it was also the season of darkness. Now, Dickens is, is beginning to portray kind of the socioeconomic conditions between those in France and those in England in the mid-18th century, but I think those words could very well describe what's going on here in Matthew chapter number 26. And, and really, we don't have to go far into the chapter to see that things are kind of coming to a head in this story of Jesus Christ, in this narrative. In fact, you can look at verse 2 of chapter number 26, and the Bible says, you know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Well, that escalated quickly. I mean, we go from a, a celebration time and a time of remembrance to all of a sudden Jesus is talking about his betrayal and his upcoming crucifixion. And so what would follow the feast of the Passover in, in the very next verse is the declaration that Jesus is saying he will be betrayed and then he will also be crucified. And so 
Think about what's, what's happened. Jesus has grown and, and, and word of him has kind of come into renown. The, the disciples had watched. In fact, they had participated, the Bible tells us, just a few days before this in Jesus' triumphal entry into the, the city of Jerusalem. And everyone there is, is shouting Hosanna and they're singing his praises. And wow, it, it was easy to follow the Lord during that time. But a storm was brewing, even at that time. Well, we, we could understand that though they are singing his praises on that day, there's coming a day and really just less than one week later when that same crowd would be shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And so the teaching and the leading and the mentoring that Jesus had been taking these disciples through during the last three years of, of their lives is now, it's kind of coming to a head. It's culminating in, in what we read here in our text this evening. And so they participate in this final meal together and they, they, they make their way up to that room that has been prepared that they had really borrowed. And Jesus paints the picture for them about these, these tragic events that are going to take place very soon. And in fact, he reveals the truth that even one of the men that is sitting with them at the table at the time is going to be the one that betrays him. So all that leads into the verses that we read here tonight. And some of the darkest days in the existence, I think, of our, our Savior, certainly. But not only for the Savior, I think there were some of the darkest days that we will read about in the life of Peter. And for us to get to 1 Peter and understand what Peter is trying to get across to those people that he is writing to, both in 1 Peter and 2 Peter, that crowd that is scattered abroad because of persecution and, and for fear of their lives, really many of them. For us to understand that Peter, we have to understand this Peter, because this Peter is what is the precursor to that Peter, so to speak. So if you know much about Peter, and, and many of us certainly do, I, I think we understand and I think we can see that there's a side of Peter that he, he really wanted to do the right thing. He, he wanted to please the Lord and he wanted to, to serve the Lord and he wanted to, to be with the Lord. He, he wanted to defend the Lord. In fact, he, he claims that several times and he even acts in that manner as well. He, he wanted to, to be the one who was not the denier. He would say, Lord, if anybody else does this, <laughs> it ain't going to be me. I will not do that. Now, all this was in his heart, but, but the truth of the matter is, it was more like only in his dream, so to speak. It, it, Jesus knew the truth of the matter, and yet Peter did not. And so the events that take place here in our passage in the Garden of Gethsemane are, are likely, again, probably the, the very darkest times in Peter's life. Now, I want you to see some of the privilege that I think Peter had. Look at verse number 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. So Peter was one of those 12 men that God had, had, had handpicked as he's making his way through the countryside. He, he's picking disciples, and he's coming and, and telling them to follow him. And Peter is one of those people. He, he's called out to, to assist the Lord and, and to, to, to stand by his side as he's carrying out that earthly ministry that, that was God's will for him here on earth. But notice also verse number 37. Peter's not just part of that initial 12. He's part of that special group of three that gets to go a little bit farther with the Lord. Verse 37, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Just three men were chosen, this exclusive group, as you will, uh, if you will rather, to, to go further along with the Lord in the garden. He, he's chosen to be in places and in situations with, with Christ that no one else on earth ever got to be. He gets to see that and, and experience that. And then verses 37 and 38, he, he's sharing in really what are the most excruciating times in the life of the Savior, because the Bible says, verse 37, he, he, he begins to be exceeding sorrowful and very heavy, the Bible says. Verse 38, even unto death. And so he tells Peter and James and John to tarry ye here and watch or pray with me. So here's Jesus, just hours away from what would be history's most atrocious act, the, the, the worst thing that we could ever think of happening. And he says, I want to spend these last few moments with you men. 
Now, some of you have been with maybe loved ones or, or close friends, and maybe you've been by their bedside and, and seen them and, and been there as they've maybe taken their last breaths of life. But, but imagine being asked to be there with the Savior of the world during that time. Can you imagine what that must have been like? It, Peter had just had, a, he had this amazing privilege. And so Jesus goes a little bit farther, the, the Bible says, and he begins to pour out his heart in, in prayer to his Father. And, and no one gets to share in that more intimately than, than Peter does. They were responsible, Jesus gave them the responsibility of watching and praying. So he has, man, amazing privilege. None of us have ever had that privilege. But also notice the great struggle that Peter has in verse number 40. He cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. And saith unto Peter, what? Could ye not watch with me one hour? So Jesus has gone. He spent some time alone in prayer. And he comes back to where he left those three men watching and praying. And he finds them not watching, not praying, but rather asleep. And for some reason, we understand the Bible tells us there's three of them, but Jesus chooses to address them through who? Peter. And I think it's probably because if you notice what Peter said in verse number 33, Peter answered and said unto him, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Look at verse 35. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. I will never be offended at you. If everyone leaves you, I will be the one who will stand by your side and I will be the one who will die with you if need be. He can't pray and watch for an hour. And Jesus addresses these men through Peter and says, Peter, you, you called me basically a liar, said I wasn't telling the truth. You, you denied what I said, and yet you can't even pray for one hour with me and for me. And it's not as if Jesus is asking too much of these men. Yes, I think it had been a long day and, and they had heard some hard and difficult things. And yet he tells them again in verse number 41, watch and pray, why? That ye enter not into temptation. Then he leaves them a second time and Jesus goes and prays very earnestly again. But verse 43, when Jesus comes back, he, he finds them again and he finds them ugh, asleep. Verse 44, Jesus leaves them sleeping once again and carries his burden alone once again to his father. Now, now don't you know, Peter didn't want it to be like that. He didn't want it to, to be that way, but, but, but that's what it was. And it's, it's fascinating to me as I uh, see verse number 41 that Jesus tells Peter exactly what the problem is. Peter, you have a problem. And I'm going to tell you exactly what the problem is. He, he's very clear. Notice verse number 41. The spirit indeed is, what's the word? But the flesh is weak. Peter, here's your problem. You have a weak flesh. You have a weak flesh. At the bottom line... When, when it comes down to brass tacks, so to speak, the, the issue was Peter could not make himself stay awake. There was probably not a time in Peter's life more important than this, this time in his life. And Peter probably even sensed in some way that that might have been the case. And yet somehow in the flesh, he could not keep his eyes open. He, he couldn't make himself stay awake. He, he was not able to pray with the Lord. He is just too weak to do so. And the reason why I emphasize that is because I think every person in here can relate to that. We can relate to Peter. Every one of us is plagued with a weak flesh. We all have it. To deny it, by the way, I think is a sign of a weak flesh. <laughs> we all have a weak flesh. And, and by a weak flesh, here's, here's what I mean. The inability to submit one's thoughts and actions to God's design, to God's rule, to the Word of God. 
the inability to submit one's thoughts and actions to God's design, to God's rule, to the Word of God. We, we find it very difficult to do that, and I think every person here, to varying degrees, has a weak flesh in that, that manner. And because of that, oftentimes when you ask people their favorite Bible character, they'll, they'll say, well, I like Peter. They associate with Peter, right? Because they, they, they can see themselves a little bit in Peter. Now, you don't have to turn there, but Romans chapter number seven, I want you to just remember in your mind what Paul said in those verses. The things that I should do, those aren't the things that I'm doing. The things that I hate in my heart, in my spirit, I, I don't want to do those things. That's what I find myself doing. Ugh. He said, I know that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. In this flesh, there's nothing good, nothing redeemable about it. It's, it's horrible, it's wicked, it's, it's so weak. And so he said, with my mind, my heart literally, I serve the, the law of God, but, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. And so he asked that question, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? Who, who is going to be the one who's going to deliver me? And it's, he's, he's pining for that day. We all have a weak flesh. I think Peter is an example here. I think Paul mentions that in Romans chapter 7. And, and we know that discouragement comes from a weak flesh. In fact, the, the results of a weak flesh can be so depressing. It, it can lead you to a point where you, you say things, maybe in your prayer to the Lord, but I didn't want to do that again. I didn't want to go there again. I didn't want to say that again. I didn't want to act like that again. God, in my heart, I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to think that. I didn't want to say that. I didn't want to fail you again in that way. And yet what happens? Well, we do. Because in large part and, and at the root level, we have a weak flesh. All of us do. But what I want us to look at is not necessarily that part in verse number 41. I, I want to look at the other side that maybe doesn't get as much of the emphasis because Jesus says in verse number 41, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And Jesus did say both. And I want to remind us, as I was reminded, again, reading through this passage and thinking through the life of Peter, I, if you don't get anything else, I want you to understand this, never underestimate the benefit of a willing spirit. A willing spirit. In the presence of a weak flesh, never underestimate the importance of a willing spirit. Because we, we have to notice that Jesus doesn't just recognize the weak flesh that, that Peter has. He says, the spirit indeed is willing. And, and he recognizes it. it's not just the weak flesh of Peter. He recognizes also, Peter, you do have a willing spirit. There, there's something that I know in you that, that you're willing and you want to do what is right. And we're not trying to, to twist the text in any way by saying that what we think Jesus is emphasizing is the willing spirit. I don't think that's the case at all. I think it seems very clear as I read through the passage and, and really the context of the passage. And in order to deal with the passage fairly, I think I, I want to be very clear that I think the emphasis is on the weak flesh. But what I want to do, rather than putting Peter under the microscope, so to speak, and we could very easily do that. By the way, we could do that in your life too. And you could do it in mine. We could find every one of those little instances where, yes, Peter's flesh was weak, and, and we could bring those out, and, and we could make some applications. Certainly, um, how about his mouth? Yeah, he has a weak flesh there. Jesus was so often having to correct him in just that, that area we're not going to zero in on those instances of a weak flesh. It's definitely there. But what I want us to do as we think about Peter and his life, and as we go into this series in First Peter, I want us to kind of take a step back and see the entirety of Peter's life. Because what you're going to see is, yes, this is what Peter is in Matthew 26. But also, if you flip a couple pages later, he becomes the leader of these 12 men. He preaches in the Spirit on the day of Pentecost and thousands are saved. 
He preaches with boldness. He proclaims truth. He's thrown in jail for doing so. And and he states that he is confident, and, and I quoted this this morning, that we ought to obey God rather than men. Peter is captured and beaten, and he's almost stoned to death for some of the things he does in declaration of Christ. He writes 1 Peter and 2 Peter to to people who have lost their homes and their well-being, their jobs. They're separated from families, all because of persecution for the very Savior he's preaching about. We have to come to the conclusion that in the midst of a weak flesh, and, and what became even more significant in the life of Peter was the presence of a willing spirit that enabled God to continue working in Peter's life. Convicting him, molding him, changing him, conforming him to the image of Christ until he became, now listen, until Peter became what Jesus died to make him to be. See, Jesus saw that in Matthew 26. Peter didn't. By the way, you and I don't. And we see some person who is maybe backslidden away from the Lord or maybe just a new believer and they're not progressing in the way or in the speed that we think they should. And all we see is them right there and now. But what I want you to understand is we need to get a vision of what God sees in that person, what they can be, if we will invest and help and disciple them and pray for them and come alongside them and encourage them. And yeah, they're going to slip up and yeah, they're going to mess up. By the way, so are you. We need to encourage and help them and see them as God sees that person. While we, yes, we we see a weak flesh, we also see a man who wanted, his desire was to please the Lord. He was crushed when he disappointed the Savior. The Bible says that as Jesus looks at him, and we'll read the verse in just a moment, he went away and he wept bitterly because he had disappointed the Lord. He, He wanted to take advantage of everything that Jesus had to offer. And here's, here's also what I, what I want us to see here. Peter demonstrates that it is not the presence of a weak flesh that leads to your ultimate failure. It is not because you have a weak flesh that you fail. What brings about failure, rather, is the absence of a willing spirit. Every one of us has a weak flesh. But what makes the difference is, do I have a willing spirit? Will I turn to God when when He is convicting and, 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 and chastising and chasing after me? It is not the presence of a weak flesh alone that will guarantee failure. It is the absence of a willing spirit. Now remember, Jesus came to Peter in John 1 and here's what He told him in essence. I know who you are. I know your past. I know where you are right now. I know every slip up you're going to have in the future. I know everything you are going to do, but I also know what you can be. I know what I will die to make you, Peter. Follow me. I will make you to become a fisher of men. The fact is, everyone in this room has been plagued with a weak flesh. But how you ultimately end up is not determined by how weak your flesh is. It is ultimately determined by how willing your spirit is. There's no doubt how weak the flesh is. But we also have this almighty and all gracious God who knows that he loves you and knows why he sent Jesus Christ to this earth to die for you in your place. He knew what you would do. He knew what you would be. He knew what you would think about. He knew what you would say. But he also knew what he would die for. There is on the one hand, yes, a weak flesh. But on the other hand, there is this gracious God. And that gracious God specializes in grace and in mercy and in forgiveness. And this gracious God who knows everything about your weak flesh, every sin you will commit, yet this gracious God nor your weak flesh is what's in question. He is willing. Yes, you are weak. But what is in question is your willing spirit to let Him continue to do His work in your life. That's the question. He is certainly the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity. 
He dwells in a high and a holy place. But the Bible also says that this same God dwells with him that is of a contrite and a humble spirit. And that spirit is something you and I have to choose to have. I don't just get sprinkled with it at birth. Humility. Well, that's a humble person. If you've ever met a humble person, you've met a person that God had to do a whole lot of work in. And by the way, is still continuing to do work in. You meet a proud person, you've met a person who God needs to do a lot of work in and who may be resisting. Maybe they don't have as willing a spirit to allow God to work in their life. I, I think also the illustration is clear, and just to use another example, I think the illustration is clear in David's life. One day David finds himself looking around and he sees this woman and arranges to have her brought to him and, and adultery ensues and she ends up pregnant. And David, in his sinful attitude, arranges to have this woman's husband come back home to make it appear like everything is okay. And then when that man has more integrity than David had, he arranges for that man to lose his life to be killed in battle. All of this is done to, to cover up more of his downfall, to, to cover up, to make it look like everything's okay. I still have this thing taken care of. I still have it covered. And what David's story looks like is a trashy novel, to be quite honest. So God sends a prophet to David, and David responds correctly. And the first words out of his mouth are, I have sinned against the Lord. And so the prophet responds right back, and God hath put away thy sin. David had a weak flesh. I think we can all see that. But when you go to Psalm 51, don't turn there. We, we don't have time necessarily. But when you go to Psalm 51, in the midst of having this weak flesh, he also has a willing spirit. How in the world is David called a man after God's own heart? Because he has a willing spirit to allow God to do the work that God wants to do in his heart and in his life. And when God is doing the knocking, David is doing the willingness to come back to his heavenly father to ask for forgiveness and to repent of those things. Is, is David a man after God's heart because he has the absence of a weak flesh? No. No. The difference is a willing spirit to follow God, to listen to God, to be willing to let God do whatever he wants and whatever he would do in his life. So what does a willing spirit look like? Well, from Peter's life, and just think with me as we kind of go through these quickly. Number one, a willing spirit dares to do what God makes possible. Dares to do what God makes possible. I love being around people that have a willing spirit. One of the biggest frustrations is when you're going into ministry or you're going into this, you know, a big day or, or going into a big week or something like that. And then the first person that you see is the one that always has a problem with something. <sighs> really? Everything's wrong? Everything can't be wrong. I mean, maybe 99% is wrong, but not everything. But I'm telling you, a person with a willing spirit and a, a cheerful spirit, it's just, it's refreshment. It, it's, it's, a, it's a joy to be around someone like that. They're, they're willing and want to do whatever is possible, whatever God is wanting to do. We see it in Peter's life. You remember when Peter walks on the water? The story is simple. Again, the disciples are in the boat. They, they experience a storm. Peter ends up doing what no man has ever done before. No man, man has ever done since. The other disciples, they never even dared to ask what Peter asked. To allow them to do this, this miracle. But Peter, again, he wants to do whatever God will, will allow him to do. Whatever is possible. Whose idea was it to walk on the water in the first place? Peter's. Lord, bid me to walk on, walk on the water to thee. Can you imagine being in that boat with what the other disciples were thinking? <laughs> this idiot, what is he doing? <laughs> what a big mouth. He's going to just ruin it again. He just, he's going to fail. I don't know why he keeps doing this. Can you imagine what kind of conversation went on the boat when he steps out? 
and he doesn't sink? <laughs> I need a camera. That's amazing. No one is going to believe this. What happened is not what they thought. Why didn't I think of that? Well, I didn't even realize that was possible. Exactly. Yes, Peter has a weak flesh, but there's also a willing spirit to do whatever God makes possible. So let's bring it then to us. We need to have a willing spirit and an initiative that says, if God offers it, then I want in on it. If God is willing, then that is what I want to do. We, ha we have all kinds of places to serve, and yet there's no doors being beaten down to get into those places. See, here, here's what I don't want us to do. I don't want us to look around at every other church member or every other Christian and say, well, this is what the average Christian is doing. And if I just stay at this level, then, then I'll be happy. Everything will be okay. Everything will work out. I won't rock the boat. I won't uh, make somebody mad or I won't uh, get mad at somebody else. I'll just even quo with the status quo, man. Just stay right where I'm at. But shouldn't we want everything that God offers? Shouldn't I want to have a willing spirit that says, God, you, you can do more with us. You can do more with my life than, than what I'm just kind of in my little rut. The definition of a rut is just the grave with the ends kicked out. <laughs> just keep on going. We have all these things that we use as excuses and, and I don't want to just settle for the norm or for the average. Let's not be limited by what just a weak flesh will allow. Peter is able to go above and beyond what probably anybody thought he would ever be able to do because he's willing to do whatever God makes possible. Okay, for example, it is possible for one of our young people to be an example of the believer. It's possible for that. It is possible for husbands to actually love their wives as Christ loved the church. It's possible. It is possible for a man's strongest addiction to be to his God, to his family, to his local church, and to the leadership and to the friends God has brought into his life. It is possible. Yes, you have a weak flesh. That's not even up for consideration. But it is possible also to have a willing spirit that says, as long as it is in the Bible, I'm going to strive to be what God says that I can be by His grace and by the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a willing spirit. But just so we're not misunderstood, number two, a willing spirit still knows how to weep over sin. Don't for one second mistake this message for excusing a weak flesh. God forbid that we would ever do that. You understand what it costs Jesus Christ because of our weak flesh. It's, it's horrible. A willing spirit, yes, is willing to do whatever God says and, and, and displays as possible, but a willing spirit also knows how to weep over its sin. Jesus told Peter he would deny him, and yet he still didn't believe what Jesus said. Though everybody else might, I won't. But that kind of pride and arrogance, I think I read somewhere in the Bible, sets you up for destruction, sets you up for a fall. So you, you need to understand, the weak flesh that Peter had, it still bothered Peter. It wasn't like he just went carefree and fancy free. He, he, he was bothered by his weak flesh. Peter's desire was to do what is right. He never believed that he would deny the Lord. That was the last thing on his mind. But look at the last verse of Matthew 26, verse 75. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Once the betrayal takes place, Peter realizes, my weak flesh did it again. I didn't want to do that. I can't believe this is what I did. 
And he goes out and he weeps bitterly. A willing spirit, okay, let's, let's break it down again. A willing spirit does not excuse a weak flesh. It weeps over it. It is broken over a weak flesh. A willing spirit doesn't find an excuse for its behavior saying, well, I'm just a man and that's the way that we are. Well, this is how I was just brought up. Or, well, I'm just a woman and that's how we act. No, no, it doesn't, doesn't do that. A willing spirit understands the need for real repentance and being broken before the Lord over one's sin. A willing spirit cannot stand the sin. It is tired of sin. It wants to do everything possible to get back into fellowship with God. Peter is going to learn this same lesson. There, there's no substitute, no substitute, no substitute for your fellowship with your God. There's no substitute for that. I don't care how much stuff you can give yourself, how well you think you take care of yourself, how fat you make yourself. No substitute. A willing spirit wants to do everything possible that God makes possible. It, it weeps over its sin. Third, a willing spirit, and Peter displays this, a willing spirit refuses to let failure become final. It's a good thing Peter didn't give up after he had denied Christ. You know why? Because Jesus Christ hadn't given up on him. He didn't give up on Peter. Peter didn't give up completely after the denial, unlike Judas had done. Remember Judas? Proverbs 24 and verse number 16, for a just man falleth seven times and does what? Riseth up again. Psalm 37 verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. Why? For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. See, don't let some failure become final in your life. Hard times, guess what it's going to bring out? Some of your worst emotions. You're, you're going to go through all kinds of emotions. They can expose some of your greatest weaknesses. They will expose your weak flesh. And people may see your weak flesh in action. And some tonight might even have a history in, in, their, in their life that causes you to think, I don't know if I could ever recover after that. I don't know if I can ever fully get over that. Can I encourage you? Don't give up too soon. Don't give up too soon. Your God isn't giving up on you. He knows what he can make you to be. The issue is not a weak flesh. Everyone has it. The issue is, do you have a willing spirit? A willing spirit never allows failure to become final. We've got three books here. These are not actually what I'm going to use them in the illustration for. Just bear with me, all right? This first book is the bio of Peter, the biography. You read through it, oh, whew, it's quite a story. There's a chapter here titled, Dumbest Statements in the Bible. It's in Peter's biography. You turn a little bit more and there it is, the sleepy garden scene that we read about in Matthew. Matthew. Turn a page and there's the denial of Christ. A couple pages over is where Peter goes back to fishing. But when you keep turning, you read the whole book. It's a great read. God takes a weak flesh in Peter. And he turns his biography from what could be a tragedy. And because Peter has a willing spirit... He turns it into a great story of victory, not because the absence of a weak flesh, but because of the presence in Peter's life of a willing spirit. Book number two, it's the biography of David. Not certain I should be reading all this. It, it feels like it's, it's meant for some, again, some trashy novel. It begins great, and what a humble person David is, and just amazing how God works in, in David's life, and then oh, turns very, very quickly. But as I keep turning the pages, and I keep reading through David's life, it ends up again, oh man, 
What a wonderful story. What an amazing read. Not because David didn't have a weak flesh, but rather because David had a willing spirit. He was willing to do what God said is possible. I will forgive if you will repent. I will restore if you will come back to me. It's a great story. Last book. This one's a bit newer and it's not finished yet. It's your biography. Now, I can see as we read through it, there are some things that you're not too pleased with. Maybe some things you're embarrassed about, maybe some things that you regret doing. As I read a little bit farther, there are some places where it looks like some pages have been attempted to be torn out, some things in your life that you're trying to get rid of, you, you hope no one ever finds out about. Some of the pages in your biography are stained with tears, heartache, struggle, disappointment, painful, depressing pages. You would love it if they were not there, but they are. Now, those pages alone don't make your biography a tragedy. The absence of a weak flesh is not what brings your story to a glorious close. In fact, if your biography, if your story ends up as a tragedy, it is because of the absence of a willing spirit in your life. It seeks not to allow God to gain victory over the deeds of the flesh. Because as we've said many times, victory doesn't come because of a weak flesh or the absence of a weak flesh. That will not happen. Victory in your life comes because you have a willing spirit to let God do what God can only do. We all have a weak flesh. Let's just get over the fact. But like Peter then, are you willing to allow God to do everything in your life that he wants to do? Try refusing to, to, to let your failure become your final story. The only thing that guarantees a tragic completion is when you make the decision, and you will make the decision, if you make the decision to have the absence of a willing spirit, I will not do what God wants me to do. I will not follow. I will not pay attention. When he is convicting, I will not listen. I might be here, but my heart is farther from this place than you could ever imagine. Pastor, do you think that that could happen in our church? Yeah. Yeah. Is it possible it could be? Yeah. It's possible. I don't know every heart. <laughs> I know what some of you are going through. And it's, it's rough stuff. But I'm asking you, in spite of your weak flesh, and you have it, don't deny it. Do you have a willing spirit to let God do the work that He can do? Will you allow Him to take all that tragedy in the past, all that stuff that you wish wasn't there, will you allow Him to make your story into a victory because you just said, you know what? I'm willing to let God do what God can do. I'm, I'm weeping over my sin. It, it breaks me up, but I'm not going to let those failures become final in my life. Will you do it? I want to encourage you. As we go into Peter... That's what he's going to encourage those people with. Hey, you're going to go through some difficult times. You're going to go through some trials. You're going to be tried as with fire. In fact, that's what we would call the series, Tried with Fire. But listen, your God is faithful. He will take care of you. He will watch over you. And though it may cost your physical, earthly life, He will give you a much greater life in eternity. The reward is, it's the best retirement plan. You couldn't even dream it up. He wants to do that in your life. Let's pray.